Today's gospel reading comes from the gospel according to Mark. We're reading chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. If you'd like to follow along in your Red Pew Bible, you can find it on page 47. Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Gracious God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to receive and respond to your word your message to us on this day. Amen. Well, last Sunday, the city of Boston, one of the most Irish cities in the country, held its annual St. Patrick's Day festivities. Crowds of green-clad revelers and lined the streets for the parade, which typically draws about one million people. It not only celebrates the city's Irish heritage, but also evacuation day, commemorating the evacuation of British troops from Boston during the Revolutionary War. Fittingly, marching and playing at the front of the parade in South Boston's neighborhood were members of the Boston Police Gaelic Column of Pipes and Drums, led, of course, by a bagpiper. So why do we invite Ian to come today instead of last Sunday, St. Patrick's Day. There's a very profound, deep reason. He wasn't available last Sunday. (laughs) Actually, there is a reason for welcoming Ian. And Ian shared with me earlier that so many of his students are playing the pipes on this day all throughout the country. This is Palm Passion Sunday, and as I mentioned, It's the beginning of Holy Week, and inviting Ian in this marvelous instrument is fitting and appropriate on so many levels. Leading off the procession of palms in our worship service, the bagpipe filled the sanctuary with loud and festive music, because it is an instrument of celebration, like those common in so many parades. I'm sure you have been to parades where there have been bagpipes. It calls to mind the joy and the vibrancy of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the festive shouts of Hosanna as the children and the bystanders threw their cloaks on the ground and waved their branches shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the pipes are appropriate for that as we begin Palm Sunday. At the same time, throughout history, the bagpipe is a martial instrument as well, with a long history of being present in battle. You have probably have heard the pipes or have seen them in military war, Battles that are reenacted, or watching movies, or the History Channel. The steady march of the piper to the tunes being played as a reminder 
that many have marched to conflict, to suffering, and even to death, to the call of the pipes. It's a reminder that there is a battle. And in that vein, the pipes' tones, of course, foreshadow the Thursday-Friday conflict, which already is threatening Jesus' triumphant entry on this very chaotic Sunday. Jesus walks into the city and goes to the temple and sees things there that are not as they should. And it's late and he leaves the city to come back the next day. And finally, the mournful wail of the bagpipe is so often present at memorial services, graveside burials. In fact, the last time we heard the sounds of the bagpipe in this sanctuary was Ian. When he was here and we celebrated the life of Wendy Jones' late husband, Peter. See, there is something about the sound of the bagpipe that seems especially appropriate to the range of experiences and meanings that take place on this Palm Passion Sunday. The range of emotions that Jesus must have felt even on that first day and throughout the coming week. And the range of emotions that we feel. My assumption is when you walked into these doors and you heard the bagpipes played, some emotion, some memory came to your mind and your heart. And they were probably varied for each and every one of them. And depending on the song or the tune that you hear, it will also evoke a different emotion. Appropriate for this Sunday as we begin Holy Week and the wide range and depths of emotions from some joy and festive celebration to the deepest agony and sorrow and pain on Thursday and Friday. Pain like no other pain. The pain of abandonment the fear of death, the belief that death has won and death has the final say, the silence of Saturday, entering into a time where there are no answers for the hard questions of life. We've all been there. And we sit with that for a while until, until the joy of Easter Sunday. And the greatest happiness, the greatest celebrations we have ever experienced, the world has ever known, all takes place within seven days. And the bagpipe represents the range of emotions of the human experience and the experience of faith in our journey as we follow Jesus on the way. We need to hear the gospel once again on this final Sunday in Lent because it does represent each of us. And perhaps we relate differently each year or during different seasons of our lives to what Palm Sunday represents. Maybe for some of you it's the hope of a coming king. Maybe it's the acknowledgement of a prophet in conflict with injustice in the world and the hope that justice and righteousness will prevail. Or maybe in this day, in this season of your, your life, it's the, the empathetic compassion of those who suffer. Maybe you are grieving the loss of a loved one or sharing in the grief of someone who has lost something or someone dear to them. And we understand Jesus as the suffering servant, willing to embrace all of humankind's suffering for us. So Jesus enters as a triumphant king, greeted by waves of palm branches, But he also marches on, he marches forward as a suffering servant. He enters to fanfare and celebration 
and will exit the same city just days later towards his crucifixion and his death. He leaves in a funeral march. Very different than how he entered. Now last week in our gospel reading, Jesus predicted his death. And now in the reading, he is entering the final week of his life. But he's entering it with passion and purpose. He was not going to live a long life on earth. But he was going to live one of great significance and one that would bring life everlasting for all those who would follow after him. Dan Buettner is a National Geographic explorer and best-selling author. He spent the last 20 years finding the longest living people in the world and learning from their wisdom. Throughout his travel and research, he discovered five places where people live to a hundred years old at the highest rates in the world. He calls these the blue zones. Now, some of these places are islands. Other places are mountains. Some are impossibly remote, and others are surprisingly urban. And though they're vastly different on the surface... Remarkably, they all share the same common denominators. These blue zones all follow roughly the same formula that produces the longest-lived people in the planet. They're living vibrant, active, happy lives. And perhaps the biggest takeaway is they live longer without trying. Now, episode one of a documentary based on his research, it's on Netflix, which I highly recommend, called Living to 100, The Blue Zones. Episode 1 begins with these words. Most of us don't even want to think about dying, getting frail, losing vitality, closing our eyes for the last time. But one thing's for sure, it's coming. The question is, when? How many years will you have left? Worldwide, about two-thirds of the eight billion people on the planet will die prematurely from avoidable diseases. And in America, for the first time in a century, our life expectancy is dropping. So how do we fix this? These are the words from Dan. I believe it's not by trying to prevent death, It's by learning how to live. Now, one of the blue zones is Okinawa. And he spent significant time there meeting with centennials. Uh, There's a concept of these centurions in Okinawa called Ikigai. And he says he believes it's one of the most powerful factors contributing to their longevity. One centennial interviewed said, I contribute to the world. The art I've created will remain for hundreds of years after I pass away. This is my ikigai. I'm blessed. Dan and his team would visit these houses. They would check the physical and medical condition of these who are living to be a hundred 104, 110. And after each visit, he would ask them the same question. What's your ikigai? And they all had one. Ikigai is a sense of mission. It's a sense of purpose. Dan Buettner thinks ikigai is the main factor of the spiritual health of these individuals, these centurions. And he believes if we lose the ikigai, we will die. Okinawans have no word for retirement. When they get to be 60, 70, 80, 90, they're still working. They might only be working in the garden to bring some vegetables home. They may have a stall in the market where they're only working in the morning. 
But they're keeping their minds engaged. They're keeping their bodies moving. They could sum up their life meaning, the reason for which they wake up in the morning. That is a gift, to be able to sum up your life meaning. Jesus knew his ikigai. And on Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, knowing that he would have to say goodbye to his friends and family, he was a man on a mission, a man with a mission. Jesus said and did many meaningful and memorable things during his last week on earth. Many of those we will remember on Thursday and Friday. He shared a special meal with his friends. He broke bread together and shared wine. He washed their feet. He spoke to them about God's love and gave them a commandment to love others in the same way. I'm sure the disciples had some questions. And I have some questions for you on this Palm Passion Sunday. What's your ikigai? Do you have one? Have you thought about this? It's not too late. What is your purpose? Your mission? When you wake up every day? Now thinking more concretely about Jesus' final week. Let me ask you this question. If you knew that your time with someone was coming to an end, what would you want to say to them? What would you want to do together? How about this question? If you knew you had one week left on earth. If you knew this was your final week, how would you want to spend it? With whom would you want to spend it? How would you want to live your final days? And how would you want to be remembered? We have some members in our congregation who know that their days, months, are coming to an end. And as painful as it is, what is remarkable is the beauty of being able to come aside them. And they know their ikigai now. They know exactly what they want to do, who they want to spend time with, what they want to say, what they want to leave behind, the impact that they want to leave on those who will come after them. And you know what's fascinating? Is it's actually bringing a deep sense of peace and joy to them. As painful as it is. My my hope and thought is most of us gathered here don't have to do that now. But the time will come. But what if we could start living for legacy now? What if we could really follow the way of Jesus, the way forward, with great courage and with passion and purpose, living today, living tomorrow, living every day of our lives like it would be our last, making decisions now that will be generative, that we know will have impact on future generations and be able to see with your own eyes what that impact will look like. Being and bringing blessing to others while you still have time to share with them. Jesus is a great example for us to follow. As he entered the city, he moved forward towards his fate with purpose And with passion. Ever mindful of his calling, he rode on. He rode on towards the cross at Calvary to bring everlasting life 
to all of the world. All of the world that God so loves that he sent his son. So friends, may we follow the way forward like Jesus and with Jesus with courage, faith, hope, love, and our own ikigai. Now and always. Amen. Friends, our offering is a time for us to reflect on God's abundant love for us. As the ushers collect the plates, I invite you to give generously in response to God's generous love for us. And as you hear Ian and the bagpipes again, whatever thoughts or emotions may fill your heart and flood your mind, enter into that as you're thinking about the calling that God has upon your life in this season. Freely have we all been received Therefore, let us freely give.